Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is this is Juan Carlos Thomas. I'm the Global Entrepreneurship Director at Technoser. Um, today, we're going to talk about the role of, of technology in helping micro, small, and medium-sized business to recover from, from COVID-19. Uh, I'm joined today by my colleague, Alice Waguero. She's, she's the Regional Entrepreneurship Manager for Technoser. East Africa. I'm an expert on the micro retailer sector. Welcome, welcome, Alice. Thank uh, you. And uh, and we should be uh, soon joined by Rudo uh, Mutambir Ranwa. I hope I'm pronouncing the last name right. Uh, she's the lead of CSR at EMEA and APAC uh, for Moody's. Um, the, she's having some technical difficulties to join, but but let's 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 get us started in the conversation uh, with with uh, a little bit of a of a video on on why this this topic is is important. Well, hopefully Rudo can can join us as well. Um, let me um, just. Um, this business for the past three years and I've been a participant of Smart Luca for the last one and a half year. I started the business because I wanted to become self-employed and also to be able to serve the community. Kuna challenges tumekuwa tukipitia Kabra Techno Serve kama mpangilio wa duka hatukuwa nao. Keeping of records hatukuwa nazo. Sikuwa najua ku calculate the daily sales. Sometimes mutu angechukua kitu kwa daily how because I was not keeping record. Nilikuwa na challenges kadha wa kadha. Mmoja wapo ikiwa ni uchafu kwa duka na pia mpangilio wa bidhaa kwa duka. Right now I'm happy about TechnoSaf because mambo na record keeping about customer relations sote TechnoSaf amenisaidia na nimefurahi wakati nilianza hii program imenisaidia jinsi ya kurelate na customers TechnoSaf wameni connect na 4G Capital ambao wame, wamenipa mkopo ambao iliweza kunisaidia kuongeza stock katika duka langu sasa hivi naona duka limepanuka naendelea kupata wateja na pia mauzo katika duka yangu yanazidi kuongezeka kupitia TechnoSaf tukajipanga kuwa na group moja katika eneo letu tumeweza kufungua Chebo Banking na Merigo Round ile pesa ambayo tumekuwa tukipata tuna ile vision tunaweza fungua kitu kama wholesale ama supermarket yenye itatuwezesha kuendeleza biashara I hope you can you can all um, be able to see watch that video. Um, welcome again, everyone. I, I see more people join. Um, I think uh, um, one of our panelists is experiencing some some problems. The um, the organization at SOCAP is trying to um, um, fix that problem, but. Uh, um, in the meantime, let's let's get started. We have a lot to cover, and 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 we're very honored to have here on the stage Alice Wawero, who has been leading our work in 
uh, technical work in East Africa uh, and as an expert in the, in the micro retailer sector. The topic for today's conversation is around how technology can help micro, small and medium sized business to recover from COVID and what opportunities arise from, from, from that. Um, let's start reflecting on, on why, why this topic is so important. And, and, and I just want to present a few figures. Uh, micro and small business are, are, uh, should be key, should be seen as key for uh, economic recovery. I will say inclusive economic recovery. Worldwide, MSMEs contribute more than 70% of employment and, and, and more than half of, of, of GDP. So there is no way that the, the economy will recover without having MSMEs uh, recovering as well. Uh, but they were particularly hit by this pandemic. Uh, in Nigeria, uh, according to a uh, recent JPL survey, 85% of Nigeria's wholesale and retail traders were forced to close at some point during the crisis. And 91% of this business reported zero income during the closure. Uh, going um, towards the other side of, of, of the planet, in Colombia, 73% of the small and medium-sized firms reported lay, laying off employees. And a recent technosurf survey found that micro-retailers in four African countries experienced a 41% decline in average sales during the initial month of the pandemic. So very, very harsh picture for micro and small businesses. But a silver lining is that entrepreneurs all over the world have adapted. One of the most important adaptations has been the adoption of, of technology. And we have seen that in TechnoSerp programs around the world. Uh, we are here to talk, as I said, uh, about how entrepreneurs in the global south are adopting technology uh, and what that means and how we can support that process and what uh, best person to, to, to discuss that than Alice Wawel, who has been leading our work uh, over the last uh, years uh, on micro-retailer development across Africa. Um, please... Um, Feel free to start adding your questions, the ideas that uh, I have a few questions for Alice and for Rudo, if, if she can join, uh, feel free to start adding your questions in the chat. I hope we can, later in the session, we can, we can address all of them. Uh, so Alice, um, you have led Technoser work with micro-retailers, as I mentioned. Could you talk a little bit about why micro-retailers are so important and how micro-retailers have been impacted by the pandemic? So thank you so much, Juan Carlos, and thank you everyone for joining. As you have seen in the video, we have painted the picture of the micro retailers that we work with. Often uh, the importance is not um, always thought of, uh, but they're very important because they create a lot of employment, they create jobs, they create incomes for communities. And in addition, they also bring um, a wide variety of basic consumer needs that is needed on a daily basis to the communities. Um, they, they are so important uh, because also about 80% of our fast moving consumer goods or basic goods, it's moved through these micro retail outlets. These are the corner shops, the shop owners serving communities and these communities mostly living in the marginalized areas or in the informal settlements. And there are communities that are not that are usually not served by you know based, uh, big retailers like supermarkets. So these are the outlets that really bring the essential goods and the services right to the communities doorsteps. Um, because these are uh, uh, micro retail outlets are very important. Technosap has worked with over tens of thousands of these micro enterprises building their capacity, supporting them to grow uh, their income and to serve their communities a lot better. Um, and we have not only worked in Kenya, we have worked in other African countries, really equipping them with the right skills to grow uh, to the next level, connect to the markets, 
connect to the supply chain, utilize digital technology uh, to make their operations a lot more efficient, and even be able to serve the customers a lot better. We believe that if these thousands of micro enterprises are supported, then we, we are supporting the wider economy of these countries that we operate in, and we are improving the livelihoods of the shop owners and their families and their communities. So even though these outlets are very critical and they're very important, as Juan Carlos has said, they have suffered significant challenges, especially during the COVID-19 crisis. A lot of them experiencing broken value chains. Uh, they were unable to get um, products from their suppliers and manufacturers because uh, of the disruptions that occurred because of the pandemic. They were also, they also suffered significant loss of their customers. Um, people stopped going to their, to their shops because traditionally these are outlets that wait for customers to come to their shops. And as a result, um, the percentage of the customers that visited their, 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 their businesses declined. And on top of that, it meant that their sales also went down. And as one Carlos also reported, um, a lot of them reported a huge decline of sales uh, during the pandemic. Um, what we realized is that uh, even prior to COVID, traditionally these are outlets that are basically analog. They were not using um, digital technology, uh, that drove the economies of the developed countries uh, even during the pandemic. And therefore, um, they were not able to, you know, to, to quickly embark on digital technology to help them move from where they were, where they were stuck to the next level. And that's where we came in as technosum leader to come in and help them utilize digital technology uh, to spotlight new opportunities spotlight opportunities to connect with their customers, to connect with the suppliers, to connect with manufacturers, um, and be able to survive the crisis and even grow um, their sales and their incomes. So thank you, Juan Carlos. Thank you, Alice. That, that's very, very helpful to get a better picture of what's, what's going on in, in the ground. And uh, congratulations for the great work you're leading in, uh, across across several countries in, in Africa on supporting these these entrepreneurs. Let me welcome very quickly Rudo Madam B. Ranwa uh, from Moody's Foundation. I'm glad Rudo that uh, you uh, managed to solve the technical last minute technical issue. Uh, thank you for uh, SOCAP organization for jumping in so so promptly. Uh, Rudo, we are um, discussing. Um, about the importance of, of, of micro and small entrepreneurs uh, in this economic uh, recovery or the economic recovery we all want to see starting pretty, pretty soon and, uh, and, and the role of technology on that. I know Moody's has carried out a lot of research about how digitization is impacting these firms. And, and if you could uh, briefly tell us uh, a little bit of, of what that research is telling uh, is, 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 is already uh, flagging. Any any relevant insights to get this conversation started? Yes, of course. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Oh, we're, we hear you loud and clear. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Juan Carlos. So um, as, as Juan Carlos mentioned, I'm Regional Head of Corporate Social Responsibility here at Moody's. I oversee the EMEA and Asia Pacific region and, you know, has been working quite well with the TechnoServe team. Really pleased to be here to share some of the, some of what our Moody's research has picked up around digitization and hopefully add value to this conversation. So uh, at a macro level, we all know that uh, the adoption of digital technologies has far reaching impact on productivity, growth, labor markets, industry, and credit. And uh, if we just break it down, so in terms of spurring the global productivity boom, uh, which will be especially important as productivity growth in a lot of countries is at an all time low. Uh, a simple example is this is sort of looking at, you know, how technology has improved production is we look at, you know, from the time taken from the invention of a product to the adoption of the product has been reduced significantly due to the introduction of technology. We're not spending as much time between that innovation and adoption process anymore. 
Um, and so that will ultimately start to boost that and other um, uh, activities and influencing factors will improve the productivity boom. Uh, similarly, there is the creation of new types of work. Um, so, you know, technology is starting to act as a substitute to labor. Uh, repetitive tasks performed by both highly and low skilled labor will be automated. And digitization, sort of looking at governments, will allow governments to operate more effectively um, and target, target public services better. Now, if we, if we bring it down to the enterprise level, the adoption of digital technologies um, has accelerated by several years. Um, and this improves the customer experience. This improves how enterprises are interacting with the supply chain, as well as some of the internal operations of these enterprises. Um, and similarly, the surveys are showing us that from a consumer's perspective, the adoption of uh, digital technologies has accelerated and even more so because of the pandemic. Now, you know, if I, if I, if I want to look at the, the context in which we are operating here with the Technosoft Partnership, whether it's in Latin America or in Africa, digital technologies really allow those forward-looking businesses to overcome some of the challenges of working within the emerging market context. And digitization provides an opportunity for innovation and ultimately to address a massive unmet demand. You know, those are kind of the key findings that I, I wanted to share today from my from the research that we've had um, on colors. Thank you, Rolo. That's, that's very insightful. And if I, if I hear you correctly, technology is, is, has been accelerating its adoption. It's bringing in, um, um, it has served as a tool to overcome these challenges, but also is bringing in more opportunities to, to, to entrepreneurs in, in emerging markets. Um, Alice, uh, that, what, what technologies have micro retailer adopted in your, in your view uh, that are bringing in more opportunities to overcome challenges and, and to even, I'm here from you, even grow their businesses. Uh, what uh, practitioners, uh, organizations like like uh, Technoserve or um, others uh, can do to support this entrepreneur's transition to, to, to the incorporation of, of more technologies in your experience? Okay, thank you so much, Juan Carlos. Um, for the micro retailers, the kind of technology they are using is really basic. It's a WhatsApp, Facebook, SMSs um, that they are familiar with and they, that are easy and accessible, easy to use and accessible to them. For example, we worked with an entrepreneur who was running a small green shop in Nairobi. And between the pandemic fears and rising prices, shoppers stayed away uh, from her shop. And at the worst point, she had seven, she was making only $7 sales a week. Our business advisor who was working closely with her helped her to identify ways to, pil to pivot her businesses. And on one was digitally, you know, enabled sales. One way was through digitally enabled sales. So she started advertising her products on Facebook and taking her orders through the WhatsApp and following up with her customers through, you know, WhatsApp and also SMSs. And what we found is that through these basic um, applications, she was able to increase her sales tenfold. And she realized that she was not going to stop there. It was going to, you know, she was going to make it a lasting change in her business, a whole uh, transformation of her business. And she was going to make her business to be fully um, online, even though she was still going to keep the, the brick and wall kind of an outlet. So even after the pandemic, she decided that this is her new way of reaching her customers, of engaging the suppliers, and engaging um, the wider ecosystem that was supporting her to grow her businesses. So entrepreneurs are using technology and mobile apps to track sales and inventory as well. And this is really helping them to strengthen their record keeping processes, which makes them um, make better decisions and makes their businesses also visible, not only to themselves, but also uh, to financiers and also to suppliers to understand how the goods are moving uh, at the micro retail level. So to help um, the entrepreneurs, we have also digitized, we had to digitize our operations as well. 
So it's not only using digital technology to help uh, the, the micro retailer do better business, but even us as an organization, we had to figure out how to make our operations digital to be able to reach beneficiaries um, a lot better. Our old model of providing support directly in shops truly needed to change. And so now, depending on the entrepreneur, we identify the entrepreneur profile, the kind of phone that they have, the kind of technology that they are able to, to use. Um, we are able to deliver training via, you know, the, the smartphone applications via WhatsApp or through SMS and to some even through phone calls. Um, we have had to tailor our training content uh, really streamlining it to what our entrepreneurs need. And that's really making a whole lot of difference to the way we are engaging the, the entrepreneurs and how the entrepreneurs are running their businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. That's, that's great insight. Uh, we, we tend to get distracted by the fanciest technology available sometimes. And, 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 and if I hear you correctly, uh, uh, what what make make the difference can be the simplest uh, of of the texts available. It could be a WhatsApp group to promote your products or uh, or to take orders. Um, so very very important insight is is, um, is to basically uh, use whatever makes sense, even the mess make a uh, simple simplest one. Um, Rudo. One of the areas uh, of Moody's research has been access to finance, which, which is usually a big, big constraint, uh, and even more so during this, this crisis. How digitization is impacting that based, based on your studies? Thanks, Juan Carlos. So, I mean, w when we home, let's, let, if we hone in particularly on the, on the micro retailers that are serviced through this, the Technosa partnership, um, we know that, you know, digitization has had a profound impact on access to finance, uh, you know, both systemically and also just very practically uh, allowing that access. So, first of all, technology is opening up new revenue streams because uh, a lot of these micro retailers are also servicing people who are unbanked. And so, you know, by introducing technology, uh, they're bringing in new customers from low income and urban rural, uh, uh, low income urban and rural populations, as well as giving these small merchants access to, uh, you know, greater visibility of their business outputs, greater visibility of their finances, understanding their stock levels. And this has all been facilitated by the new wave of technology, particularly for the unbanked. Um, you know, mobile money accounts are now the first point of entry for many uh, of these micro retailers. So, you know, as, as Alice mentioned, a lot of the technology is, is really uh, basic in terms of, you know, through WhatsApp, through Facebook, etc. You know, and the growing mobile phone penetration in low income populations combined with the use of the small shops as banking agents is providing that first level entry point for many, particularly in emerging markets. And then we have the issue of, you know, when it comes to mainstream finance, there are some barriers around, you know, whether you have the right ID uh, identification details to help you to access mainstream finance. And again, digital IDs and electronic payments have broken these barriers. Um, and it's brought many of these sort of micro retails into the form formal financial sector. Um, you know, for you know, in Latin America and in Africa, we've seen these electronic payment platforms allowing you know the underbanked to progress from sort of occasional cash withdrawals to kind of really addressing you know their cash flow through having access to that information, savings, insurance products. Um, so, so the 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 very idea that you can have digitization facilitating these IDs and, and, and breaking through these barriers um, is, is, you know, it's, it's, it's really impressive. And then just lastly, just to touch on sort of data analytics and artificial intelligence, which is sort of the next level uh, and, and is actually really playing a part in even the, the most basic of, of technology um, implements, so through mobile phones, through Facebooks. Um, this, the data analytics, analytics and the artificial intelligence are really allowing some of the financial, um, you know, fintech organizations to offer credit 
to unbanked clients by analyzing some of the data that is held in the smartphone. I mean, if we, if we touch on kind of the, the main impact on access to finance, I would say those are the three. Um, and I think it's, you know, as Alex can attest, it's having a profound impact on the growth of the micro retailers that you're working with. Yeah. Thank you, Rolo. That's, uh, that's very, very helpful. Um, it's, it's, your report is available, I think, publicly, isn't it, uh, Rolo? Is uh, the research is it something so, uh, people can, can access to or is it very insightful? Yes, I can certainly share the report with the attendees of this session. Our reports are not usually available sort of open source, certainly not all of them, but I can share the ones we're talking about today with the group today. Oh, that will be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. We have a few questions from, from, from the audience. Uh, I want to make sure we, we, we touch on those uh, and, and please uh, keep, keep those questions coming. Robert is asking, uh, what are some ways you train and upskill uh, the entrepreneurs? Um, Alice, I don't know if you want to take that one. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Robert. Um, so we identified the key skills gaps uh, that the micro enterprises had, and one of the major skill gaps that we found was um, um, they, they had some form of limited capability to keep sufficient uh, record keeping um, rec books of records for their businesses, and um, a lot of them also needed a lot of skills to connect to their customers. They needed a lot of skills to manage their inventory first in, first out, and even connect to the suppliers. So we put together some elaborate curriculum um, curriculum or training modules that addressed financial, basic financial management for the micro retailers, addressed inventory management, addressed um, supply chain management, and also customer care. And we have found that with this, equipped with these skills, they are making significant increase in their revenues and they are improving the efficiency with which they run their businesses. And recently we realized that digital technology is a very key skill that we needed to continuously keep on building uh, the entrepreneurs with, introducing them to basic digital skills to allow them to uh, utilize the various app business applications that they needed to use for their businesses. Thank you, Alice. Um, another interesting question from Chrisila now uh, is whether you have found uh, uh, any difference in, in uptake between women and men entrepreneurs and how how programs are addressing that. Uh, I don't know, Rudo, if that's coming up in your research or, or Alice, if you want to take the question from, from the program perspective that you're leading, I mean, feel free to uh, jump in where it feels comfortable with that question. I mean, I'll let Alice take this one and I can add uh, a little bit on around some of the gender mainstream we've seen from research. Um, thank you, Rudolf. Um, thank you, Chrisilla, for this question. Uh, for, for every business, most of the times, women are usually disadvantaged, especially in the global south. And I would want to say that during COVID-19, they were even more disadvantaged because of the crisis, because of the burden of care that came uh, with them taking care of their families and they had very little time even to support their businesses. So that in itself made women businesses uh, really go down. And what that means is that there's the a significant gap between um, uh, them being able to, you know, to make sufficient income like their male counterpart. And when it comes then to training, we found that um, women entrepreneurs who are not catching up with our training modules as, uh, as, as, as the male counterpart because of the time of the training, uh, um, we, in the time of the training that we were offering, some of the women would be busy probably taking care of their domestic jobs. And therefore, we had to really change our training timing so that we can be able to reach the women. We made our training so flexible such that um, we make it, uh, we offer it during the whole week so that once it's online, women can choose the time that is appropriate for them to, you know, to, to really engage with it. And our business counselors would be flexible to any question 
that the, the business that the women entrepreneurs would be having. So what we realize is that um, technology is bringing also a gap to the women entrepreneurs if it's not utilized very well. And a lot of them also had um, fewer smartphones as compared to the men. So even helping them be able to access uh, smartphones so that they can be able to access our full package of training became very critical even during uh, the time of uh, the pandemic. So we have identified the key critical gaps that are making the women uh, fall off or, or be left behind. And we are working towards addressing all those skills gaps, including things of training, accessing digital technology, accessing uh, digital, uh, even the internet itself, so that they are able to access all these um, apps and solutions and be able to run their, their businesses as effectively. Maybe Ruta, you could add. Yeah, no, um, Alice, I think you, you covered the majority of it. I think women have, we, we know that the issues around the um, unequal access to, you know, some of these opportunities is pervasive. You know, there's an issue of the kind of general challenges to women accessing these opportunities, you know, having role models, etc. cetera. Um, you know, so, some challenges that are seen as quite general, but we know that they have a, a really um significant impact on their ability to actually start businesses, run sustainable businesses and grow their their businesses. So as Alice mentioned, things like, you know, the way that they have to split up their time between home and work and, and everything else that, you know, women carry an extra burden. The research shows that, you know, um, across the board, these are the challenges that are, are met by all women entrepreneurs. In many markets, there have been significant gaps in bridging there have been significant strides in bridging those gaps um, through working with governments, through, um, you know, some of the more gender mainstreaming that's happening with, with corporates, corporate foundations and other funders of this type of um, intervention to help uh, women entrepreneurs. But we do know that we're still a long way away. Um, there's still the issue of cultural norms that that are really present, particularly in the emerging markets. Um but I do think, you know, certainly in my experience of working with TechnoServe and in supporting the programs that we have in this portfolio, we're really proud of the fact that we've been able to reach, I think, the majority of the portfolio, and Alice, keep me honest here, the majority of the portfolio is women um, that we are accessing through the, the Smart Duca program. But I think that's really down to, you know, as Alice mentioned, the implementing partners thinking flexibly around addressing some of these barriers. I think the more general barriers are addressed, um, you know, the, the, the more cumulative the turnaround is all the way up to policy level. Thank you so much, uh, Raul and Alice. Great, great uh, experience and insights coming from that. Um, we have another question from Raul. He's wondering whether uh, helping the SMEs digitize their accounting and financial can help in uh, building enough credit uh, history or worthiness to get access to formal finance in, in East Africa. Any any thoughts around that, Ruth or Alice? Yeah, I could take that. Uh, thanks, Rahul, for that question. And allow me to say that digitizing accounting and financial systems for the micro retailers is one first big step towards uh, creating a lot of visibility to, uh, to the financial systems in in the country. Um, the micro retailers have been 98% cash business and 90% of the micro retailers have not been keeping records that are credible to any financier. I wouldn't say that we have reached there, but it's a big step towards creating a lot of visibility around transactions that happens in the micro retailers, leading to you know uh, some form of credit uh, history around, uh, backed by the transactions that happens in the micro retail outlets. What we have done in the past with the financials, like we mentioned, the Fortune Capital, is um, they, they have been deliberate about supporting the micro retail, supporting them in terms of observing their credit history, observing their transaction for a period of time, and being able to determine a credit rating and be able to finally on lead to the micro retailers. The micro retailers may not fit in the traditional financial systems, but the financiers needs to look at 
developing appropriate financial product that works for the micro retailers. And Alice, I think um, the other point in that is that, you know, I think you're very right. That's a big first step. I think a lot of these interventions need to happen in tandem. Um, they need to be layered with, you know, other interventions like that digital literacy, the infrastructure, um, the enabling environment from, you know, the, the governments as well um, to help with some of this adoption. And like you said, you know, the financial services sort of understanding the risk profile of some of the micro retailers and, and innovating accordingly. Thank you. That's that's very interesting, Rudo. And and, and um, I wonder whether there are opportunities for for investors themselves to 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 help in this process uh, for digitization. Uh. Yeah, um, I think absolutely. You know, the lockdown and the social distancing and everything that we've experienced in the last eighteen months has really imposed a radical rethinking of business models. Um, so everyone moved their operations online, you know, people are working smarter and they really had to do this within short notice. Um, and really the majority of the non-digital MSMEs make up about 90% of businesses, particularly in emerging markets. And they are also serving non-digital customers. So, you know, to ensure that these, the, the customer, the, the business, the enterprises, as well as the consumers are not getting left behind, I think there's definitely a need for a collaborative approach, um, you know, between, as I mentioned, you know, the implementing agencies, investors, corporations, policymakers, to encourage these digital, digital solutions, uh, particularly for this large offline market. And, you know, like I said, just now, a lot of these interventions need to happen in tandem between the technical assistance, their infrastructure, um, the layering of digital products on already familiar um, offline processes. Um, and I think it's, it's important to really start channeling, you know, capital expertise, um, you know, within this space. I, I do think that there is, I think it goes without saying that there is a lot of opportunity here, um, you know, for investors, for corporate foundations, for, you know, uh, developing agencies alike. Thank you, Rolo. That's that's very helpful. Alice, uh, the problem is huge. I mean, the challenge is huge and the opportunity is huge. Uh, so what what work remains to be done to support micro-retailers' adoption of technology? Uh, and how do we keep the momentum going? Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, they still need to continuously build the capacity of the micro enterprises or the micro retailers uh, to be able to utilize available digital technology. Uh, we are incorporating some basic digital literacy uh, modules in our training curriculum. So building the digital capability remains to be huge for us and huge in the space that um, other players can actually come in and help build the digital capabilities so that um, we ensure that any micro enterprise or any micro retailer that is excluded is not left behind uh, from taking advantage of the digital economy and growing their businesses. We also need to support the micro entrepreneurs to identify the high value apps. I would imagine that um, in, in a world where there's thousands and thousands of applications, even the micro entrepreneurs themselves, they are lost in terms of identifying which apps would make a lot of uh, uh, value or would add a lot of value to their businesses. So supporting them to identify the high value apps and solutions that are suitable for their enterprises is very important. And what we are doing at the moment is helping them uh, battle together the useful business apps uh, and working towards helping them have a one-click solution. So these are apps around, you know, basic things that they require on a daily basis, like record keeping, access to finance, inventory management, and even the training applications. And they can be able to click uh, on all these useful applications for their businesses. There's also need for continuous testing of solutions that can be used offline as the cost of internet is still very prohibitory in this um, um, in, in the developing countries, and even more so to the micro entrepreneurs. So um, more offline solutions that really truly make a lot of um, uh, difference to the micro retailers are still needed. 
And um, there's room for a lot of partnership. partnerships that brings the right solutions to the micro retailers and the micro enterprises uh, to innovate and to bring um, um, solutions that work to connect these micro entrepreneurs and micro retailers to the wider ecosystem. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, thank you, Alice. Rudo, any 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 thought on this? Uh, Modis has been playing this field for for a while, uh, supporting programs, uh, advancing research. Uh, what's what what should be coming next? Where where the energy should be focused in terms of supporting uh, better adoption or more adoption of, of technology or a smarter adoption of technology among uh, micro entrepreneurs? Sure. I think, you know, from a, a funder's perspective, you know, what has really worked for us is having a, an evaluative approach to how we fund programs. So, you know, we, we want to have conversations with, with partners like Technoserve to understand, you know, when we started funding, this is what we were focused on. As the needs evolve, as the, the landscape evolves, what is it that is 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 a priority in terms of upskilling these entrepreneurs? You know, I think it, it's important for us to to continue to have those types of conversations and channel our funding, our expertise to the most emerging, you know, to, to kind of the, the, the needs that are coming up front. Um, you know, secondly, I think, you know, leveraging technologies that you have within your organization, you know, our partnerships are not solely based on grants. It's about leveraging the expertise and the skills of our business. You know, we have um, solutions for SMEs around cash flow, most recently around, ESG score predictor. So leveraging our, our core expertise as well as our funding to, to address the most pressing needs for our partners. And I think to keep the dialogue open and to evolve as the needs change. Thank you so much, Rudo. Uh, that's that's very helpful. I'm, I was reflecting what are my main takeaways from this conversation. And uh, I will say uh, personally, uh, uh, I, I, I hear from both of you a user-centric centric approach. So let's use the technology that, that suits the best. Let's focus on how we help uh, women uh, overcome the challenges to, to uh, that they're facing uh, rather than imposing uh, a particular technology that may be fancy at the moment or a solution that may uh, sound great in, uh, um, in, on paper. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, learning and a lot of trying and testing uh, and figuring out what's working, what's not, and iterating around that. Uh, that's that's my my main takeaways here. Uh, I'm sure all uh, the 30 participants or so that joined the session had their own learnings, and I hope everyone uh, had uh, a fruitful uh, uh, found that this this session was fruitful and and, and interesting. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists, Rudo and Alice. Uh, it has been um, a huge pleasure for me to, to be able to moderate this conversation. A lot of uh, great uh, food for thought here. Uh, and thank you for all our uh, attendees and, and to Soko, Soka for organizing this session.